Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for that evidence that you are sufficient to change lives. For brothers and sisters obedient to the call upon their life. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you just speak through me to give testimony of what you are doing through them. The lessons that we can learn here to apply in our own lives. The Lord, you are a God who speaks across continents, across time. Through brothers and sisters in the past who have gone out on the mission field and paid with their life, and yet have a witness down the centuries. Our Heavenly Father, there is no difference for us here, for each of us here have a mission field, be it our own family or the workplace, our street or city. Lord, quicken our hearts to submit to you, that you would be our all in all that we would not warm pews, but we would go out and engage in the battle and submit to what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Christ in these days, where the battle is enjoined, real and vigorous, on the streets as we look around this city. Lord God Almighty, speak to us this day, not as another sermon, Lord, but to quicken our hearts in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. What has burdened my heart since we got back and when I, I weep when I look at those pictures because those are brothers and sisters who have submitted to God in their life. After 16 years, we let some of our most senior workers go, driftwood. The Lord came and he took an axe to the vine and he removed the dead wood. And for those who were productive, he pruned even harder. And that's what he's doing out there. And we look in awe at what the Lord God Almighty is doing in that place. And you see the fruit. Last year we had a handful in the Mission Bungalow. Now we have 30 or 40 crammed into the clinic waiting room at a weekend, paddling up to six hours through rain. Men and women in their 60s in a dugout canoe, hungry for the word of God coming with no expectations but to sit in 30 degrees and mosquitoes for six to eight hours because they're hungry to learn of their God. Leaving all and following him is really humbling and it's challenging. So what I bring to you is a plea for surrender, which I, which I preach to myself as much as to you. And I do it in love, but there's an urgency in this day for surrender in every aspect of our life. Andrew Murray, Scottish heritage, born in South Africa. Every word he wrote, an absolute gem. And I, I, I encourage you to re re read his work. Died in early 1900s. There's a couple of paragraphs which some of you may have seen on an email I sent around. And I, I copied this and I sent it to every worker out there. He writes, absolute surrender. Let me tell you where I got those words. I use them myself often and you've heard them numberless times. But in Scotland, once I was in a company where we were talking about the condition of Christ's church and what the great need of the church and of believers is. And there was in our company a godly worker who has much to do in training workers. And I asked him what he would say was a great need of the church and the message that ought to be preached. And he answered very quietly, simply and determinedly, 
absolute surrender to God is the one thing. The word struck me as never before. And that man began to tell how in the workers with whom he had to deal, he finds that if they are sound on that point, even though they may be backward, they are willing to be taught and helped and they always improve. Whereas others who are not sound on that point very often go back and leave the work. The condition for obtaining God's full blessing is absolute surrender to him. What a powerful couple of statements. And we have seen over the past 18 months that working out exactly in the mission. And the result of that is a harvest of souls, which is what we are about, be it in mission, be it the church. That is what we are sent out in the Great Commission to do, make disciples. And to do that, we must be surrendered to him. This must be the purpose for all who purport to follow Christ. And yet when you think of what surrendering is in a military situation, surrender is when you capitulate to an overwhelming force that is coming upon you, where you have gauged it and found it to be in excess of what you can retort with. It's a flooding of your defences, such that there is no point in fighting to lay down your weapons and surrender to an enemy authority that is imposing its will upon you. Surrender in the truest sense means the accommodation under a new authority. Resistance is futile. One of the greatest examples of surrendering I can think of, and one which I find very unattractive personally, is a general anaesthetic. That is, to me, total surrender. Paralysis, unconsciousness, unable to breathe, unable to move, and completely in the hands of somebody else. Giving away of control. But with Christian surrender, I put it to you, it's a very different situation. It's not capitulating to a force which is determined to exert authority over you. It's not like a province in the Middle East that's coming under Roman jurisdiction where a cataclysmic force of Roman military power consigns a provincial force of soldiers to capitulation. No, no, it's not that at all. It's in actual fact the direct opposition of that. When we surrender to God, conversely to what we expect, we actually find complete freedom. We are released from the prison of our sin. We are released from man's domination over us over the sinful heart that dominates our life. Surrendering to God is to be truly free. John 8, 34 to 36, Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. When we hand over our will to him and surrender to him, we are then free. God's economy is the inverse of man's economy. Matthew 16, 25, for whosoever will save his life will lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And yet there's an extra factor in here. Because though we are free in Christ, 
we still have that dead carnal carcass of ourselves strapped to our back which we have to carry around we all recognize that the old man that will be with us until the day the Lord takes us or comes back and I want you to hold on to that idea that though we are free we still carry around the dead man with us and I think the mature Christian is one who acknowledges that fact the dichotomy of freedom in one sense but the perpetual carnality that is going to rise up with just a moment's notice and yet the modern church and secular thinking would suggest the antithesis of that it affirms there's an integrity a goodness a nobility about the human condition humanism tells us of the magnitude of human ability how often do we hear people saying I just believe that humans are essentially good well I don't and I think when we look around the evidence of our eyes would support that view the level of evil in the world that we look our thought life if our brothers and sisters here could just see into our minds it would be chilling I want to put before you four ideas of concerning surrender and I think all of us fit into the into one of these categories and maybe flip-flop between two or three I think the Christian can surrender in one of four ways the first one and I think it's the most predominant is surrendering as lip service you remember Ravenhill's quote that a Christian lies most when he sings and as we sing out I surrender all our mind is completely elsewhere if we stood before God and said I surrender all do we I suggest we don't it's lip service Ezekiel 33 paints this so beautifully let me just read a few verses to illustrate what I mean then shall they know that I am the Lord when I have laid the land most desolate because of all their abominations which they have committed also thou son of man the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses and speak one to another every one to his brother saying come I pray you and hear what the word that cometh forth from the Lord and they come unto thee as the people cometh and they sit before thee as my people and they hear thy words but they will not do them for with their mouth they show much love but their heart goeth after their covetousness and lo thou art unto them as a lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument for they hear thy words but they do them not Christians gorge themselves on YouTube and conferences and meetings stuffed full of enough teaching to last a lifetime but does it affect change in the spirit I stand accused in the same way how many conferences have I been to and how much have I changed as a result of that because of that dead man on my back we're stony unyielding stiff-necked unregenerate so much of Christianity is sensual not spiritual it tickles the ears 
It transitorily touches us and then it's gone. There's no traction. There's no true change. Some of our workers worked with us for 16 years and every morning we would have a devotion and we wanted to build everyone up so everyone took it in turns to do to be the pastor for the day and they could trot out the best songs and prayers and devotions and yet you only had to watch them in the daytime and you saw that it was just lip service and nothing more Even our kidnappers, stoned out of their heads, had devotions each day, singing the same songs sometimes, praying ostensibly to, to the same God, so they thought. Lip service, no currency at all in it. God is offended by that. Think of Isaiah, where he's offended by the new moon sacrifices, the blood of bulls, he's had enough, the hypocrisy that comes out. It's horrific. Well, God did a work in our organization. He took out all of those. Second point, conditional surrender. Let us turn to Jeremiah 42, if you have a Bible. The Babylonians have come. Jerusalem lies in tatters, raised to the ground. Most killed, most taken. A remnant there. Nothing to eat, no shelter, no hope. Then all the captains of the forces, and Johanan the son of Keriah, and Jezaniah the son of Hoshiah, and all the people from the least even to the greatest came near, and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech thee, our supplication be accepted before thee, and pray for us unto the Lord thy God, even for all this remnant, for we are left but a few of many. As thine, as thine eyes do behold us, that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk and the thing that we may do. Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words, and it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord shall answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not even according to all things for the which the Lord thy God shall send thee to, to us, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God, to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. And it came to pass after ten days that the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah. Then called he Johanan the son of Kariah, and all the captains of the forces which were with him, and all the people from the least even to the greatest, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto whom ye sent me to present your supplication before him. If ye will still abide in this land, then will I build you and not pull you down, and I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I repent me of the evil that I have done unto you. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, to whom ye are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand, and I will show mercies unto you, that he may have mercy upon you and cause you to return to your own land. But if ye say, we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no, we will go into the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there we will dwell. 
And now therefore hear the word of the Lord, ye remnant of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if ye wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt and go and sojourn there, this is what the Lord God says. Then it shall come to pass that the sword which ye feared shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine whereof ye were afraid shall follow you close after you there in Egypt, and there ye shall die. Well, that's pretty clear, isn't it? They want surrender to God's will for their life. They've sent Jeremiah to pray to God, and they've said, whatever, he, whatever your God says, we will do. We trust you. They're in the desolation of the remnant of Jerusalem itself. And yet God turns around and says, stay here. Stay in this desolation. Don't go to Egypt. And Egypt, of course, is the land of milk and honey, the fertile Nile Delta and all that it gives. It must have weighed heavy on their mind. But they said, no, we're going to obey God. And God says, if you go to Egypt, you're going to die which seems inconceivable when you're in Jerusalem, when everyone almost is dead or in captivity. Egypt looks so attractive. The next chapter, verse 2, this is the response of Azariah, who sought Jeremiah's intervention. Then spake Azariah, the son of Hoshiah, and Johanan, the son of Cariah, and all the proud men, saying unto Jerusalem, uh, to Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt and sojourn there. They just refuse. They prayed for God's will to submit to him. God laid out his will and they rejected it. And note that word, and all the proud men, pride, in the middle of that they're conditionally surrendering to god but only if he answers them according to their desires how often do we do that we pray having already made a decision we just want the rubber stamp on it to just say we prayed for it we can't come up with any alternative argument against our decision God hasn't intervened, we're the thunderbolt, therefore everything is sanctioned of God. Have we waited on God? Have we fasted? Have we really sought him? Have we actually got the carcass and examined it on our back to say, that is probably what the old man that I'm carrying around would like? Or have we submitted truly to God? They live to their own ends. And they live to destruction. The third form of surrender as a Christian, I think is probably one which I, I suspect most of you in here fall, fall into the heartfelt but untested affirmation of surrender. It's a bit of a mouthful. Let me explain what I mean. If we think of Peter in Luke, where, Luke, where Peter's outraged at Jesus being ta taken and says in Luke 22:33. I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And Jesus turns, knowing Peter so well. And he says, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. You see, what we have here is a man who is conscious of the reality of Christ. And his new regenerate heart is so hungry for intimacy and fellowship with him, he will do anything, he will say anything, because that's genuinely what he wants. But the old man he's carrying around is not capable of responding. There is not a synthesis 
There's not a domination of the new man, man subjugating the old, such that he can carry around the old man without it interrupting. It still rears its head. Even though his heart is winsome, it's soft, it's seeking after him. Think in, in Mark of the Father, who wants to believe that Jesus will heal his child. He's more literate of the old man. The father of the child cried out and said with tears, there's real anguish here in this man, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Here's a man who's literate, whose heart is so desirous of following God. And yet he recognizes that faith is so small. That's a true prayer. I can really identify with that man. I was talking to a brother earlier who I think exemplified exactly that. How many times we fall over and pick ourselves up and say, oh Lord, I just want more of you, but this thing on my back, it's still having its way. But my heart is pursuing after you, but the weight of the dead man on my back is, is coming at a price. Spurgeon writes about that man and his child, that this was a faith that triumphed over the devil. If you come and say, Lord, I yield myself in absolute surrender to my God, even though it be with a trembling heart and with the consciousness, I do not feel the power. I do not feel the determination. I do not feel the assurance. It will succeed. Be not afraid, but come just as you are. And even in the midst of your trembling, the power of the Holy Spirit will work. I identify with that. How many times we pray half believing and yet our heart is aching that we will have that intimacy with God. And so we move to number four, which is the settled and affirmed surrender, a progressive act of will, an act of intention and purpose underpinned by a desire to know God at any cost. That last man uh, who speaks, I, I did uh, his voice in uh, subtitles because he's difficult to understand. He came to us for two years saying, God has told me I need to be in your organization. And we said, where do you live? He lived in a city three hours away with three kids and we're offering him not enough to pay his rent I don't think in the city and yet he just came all the time God has told me I must work in this organization and we said please we can't pay you a living wage for the city he was bludgeoned when the kidnappers came for us they attacked him outside and beat him up. And he still came back. He's a man who surrendered to God for a call on his life. He has lots of ups and downs. But God, he's the, he's the newest recruit and he's probably the first person we thought of that God put on our heart to keep. The settled and affirmed surrender, a progressive act of will. Because of time, I, I won't read the whole thing, but if we think in 2 Chronicles 1 of Solomon, a man who had everything, who had built the temple, the brazen altar, sacrificed a thousand bulls, 
In verse 7 to Chronicles 1, God appears to Solomon at night and says, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon, in gratitude for his father, asks, Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this thy people that is so great? A man who has everything yet asks in line with God's desire for what he would ask, for wisdom and knowledge, as Brother Paul was saying earlier in his opening prayer. Wisdom and knowledge. Recognizing that he was weak. How could he judge the people? Well, he did not have the skills. So he asked in line, having done everything, put everything, put the house of God in order. According to God's edicts, in reverence, no, no shortcuts, and then asked according to God's will. And God rewarded him. Not only that, but with riches, wealth, power. As we read on, and I know in Chronicles it tends to give the good side of Solomon, and we see in Kings he married the strange wives, and that old carcass he was carrying around still reared its head, and he fell. But nevertheless, we see a man here at this point submitting to God in a way that brought the blessing. Think of Abraham and Isaac. When God told him to go and sacrifice his son. In Genesis 22 it says, and he rose early. He didn't wait for doubt to creep in, the old man on his back to rise up and say, well, there's no rush for this. You better just have a chat to your son, think about it, make sure it's right. He rose early. There was no time for delay. He had heard from God he was going to act. And God could trust him with that because he had taken him through a series of trials. And therefore, the more he submitted, the bigger the trials got. The more he was purged, the more fruit that came. And then we think of our Saviour. All human, all God. In Matthew 26, 39, where he knows what he's going to face. He knows not just the physical agony of the cross, but he is going to spiritually bear every sin of the whole of mankind for eternity. What possible pain could that be? We, ha we have no conception of the agony he suffered. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Recognizing the human struggle, yet in total submission, perfect, blemishless, and sinless, submitting to God, sweating blood, which you can do. It's not apocryphal. In times of deep stress, your capillaries can leak and you can sweat blood. A foretaste of the blood that he would give up. Jesus Christ paid that ultimate price and submitted to God's will and we saw the blessing that came through that such that he sits on the right hand of the Father and aren't we grateful for that that the Son of God submitted himself totally surrendered to the will of his Father so where does it leave us Absolute surrender brings intimacy with God. It suppresses the voice of the dead man on our back and aligns us for blessings. Now, 
not being a seeker-friendly church, I can't guarantee you what the blessings are going to be in this world. Absolute surrender for a lot of churches implies God is going to use us dramatically, a ministry, possessions, wealth, mission. Well, he may use us in that way. He may use us dramatically, but equally, he may not. But he still asks for absolute surrender of our will to him. Recall that hymn, Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Charlotte Elliot, a woman who suffered ill health all her life, couldn't do anything. And when the family were going to be involved in the evangelical outrage, she so looked forward to being part of that. And the day came and she was too ill and had to go to her bed again. Maybe it was TB, I'm not sure. And she was so beset by that feeling of failure that she penned her understanding of the only thing that she had and that was her volition, her will to surrender to God. And that hymn is what she wrote in her bedroom in response to that inability to be part of this evangelical outrage. She said, the only thing I have is I come to you, I surrender to you. And when we look at the fruit of that hymn, hundreds of people have done that final step of capitulating, of laying everything down and coming to Christ when that is played. Massive fruit, because it speaks of a woman who in her weakness surrenders just her will, her being to God. Some of you may know Kurt Wise, he's probably the most qualified creationist a lot of creationists have degrees from slightly iffy places, but this guy has a PhD from Harvard in physics, so he can speak. And I really respect him because he looked at the Bible and he looked at evolution and said to himself and publicly that the two don't match. And he's publicly stated in a, in a book called Six Days that even if science proves evolution to be true and creation is nonsense, he will still believe the word of God. And he surrendered his career on the basis of that. That no matter what his eyes said, he is surrendered to the, to the authority of God's scripture in his life. That's really powerful, isn't it? It's amazing. Going along, but saying, no matter what I see, no matter what I'm doing, I am surrendered to the truth of God. So much so that Dawkins says he's not a hypocrite. He's got a grudging respect for him. He says he's the only creationist who has that authenticity. So, if we're not going to be used dramatically of God, what can we do? How do we surrender? Well, I put it to you, brothers and sisters, it's a progressive act of will that we have to recognize that we have the old man still dragging around. But we can put it down and quieten it by constantly coming into the presence of our Savior and saying, Lord, forgive me. Lift me up again. I surrender everything to you. I am a sinner saved by grace. My volition is to follow you. As Alex says on that thing, come hell or high water, who else has the words of eternal life? Nobody. 
We need a fear of the Almighty God and a trembling of knowing our weakness. Because when we know our weakness and we know our faults, the enemy has no ability to accuse us because we already state it back. I am weak. I am this, I am that. That's the old man on my back. But my regenerated heart tells me that by his grace, I am more than a conqueror through Christ who lives in me. And I am surrendering this day to follow you and allow your strength to work through me. Our small team have done that. Some of those are barely literate. They've got massive issues and problems and have been through the mill. But when I received that film of when they go out and preach Christ crucified with their own witness of their own inadequacies, they see the fruit that comes through that submission and that surrender to God's will. It's really not difficult. Micah 6, 8, he hath showed me, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee and me but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. When we surrender to God, we walk with him. And we have no greater example than Jesus Christ himself for that. So I just want to encourage you, let us analyze our hearts, because our hearts are deceitful. I want to encourage you, when we acknowledge who we are and the nature of that old man strapped to our back, we diffuse the accusations of the enemy. We can, I wouldn't say laugh in the face of adversity, but when we look at our weaknesses, we disempower the enemy by just confessing them. Because the Lord is sufficient. The Lord is sufficient to bear fruit in our lives when we absolutely surrender to him. And he is sufficient. He is sufficient. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you give us the opportunity to simply come before you and lay it down that you are the only God who desires our heart. There is nothing that we can do or say that has currency with you but to lay our heart down and acknowledge that you are sufficient, that you are the all-perfect, that it is in your strength that we that we are made perfect through the blood of Christ shed at Calvary. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that the enemy is an accuser, a liar. We thank you that your word says that we should commune with our heart upon our bed and be still and bring everything before you and simply surrender to you, Lord, that you would use us in these days. As Vivian says, let us be useful in these days and in days to come, that we will glorify you with every fiber of our being, that you would have fruit through our lives to your glory, your majesty, and your holiness and perfection. In Jesus' name, amen.